which is compact, zero knowledge proofs, yada, 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 yada. Yad. And um, all these things are also cryptography now. But uh, there's that whole information wants to be free, so uh, DRM is not really a thing because people will find a way to leak the thing and tor torrent the information and everything just gets around. But then there's the opposite, uh, or there's the st stressing the point that information does want to be free, so all your emails can be read by anyone who wants to read them if they're in plain text. All your internet traffic is shared, all your social network, as in all the friends that you have via WhatsApp conversations and stuff like that, are also shared. So how do you secure all of that information when it wants to make itself freely available? And so that's where he draws the definition that cryptography is actually the art and the science we use to fight the fundamental nature of information, to bend it to our political and moral will and to direct it to human ends against all sh chances and efforts to oppose it. So yeah, I love that definition. So that's the definition we're going to be using uh, through this talk. Cryptography is information bending, if you are the last airbender fan. Mm -hmm. So a little uh, background for the things that I'm assuming that everyone knows for this talk, or you should know for this talk. Uh, Symmetric cryptography, basically the good old, you have a password, you encrypt a file, you give someone the password, and then the person will have to use that password to decrypt the file. So it's symmetric because encryption is the cryptographic operation, and the password is the key, and you need the key to undo the cryptographic operation. And then you get the other type of cryptography, which is asymmetric uh, cryptography. Now you have a public key and a private key, and you use the private key to encrypt the file, and you use a public key to decrypt the file. Uh, HTTPS works like that. Bitcoin works like that, and because all transactions, or most transactions actually, have a public key which gets coins sent to it, and then you spend the coin by signing the transaction to spend the money that you got sent. So it then creates a network of transactions or linked transactions to say, okay, this person, blah, 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 blah. And so Bitcoin, since it's an open source protocol, has these cool things they call uh, Bitcoin improvement proposals. And uh, even you, if you think you have an idea, why doesn't Bitcoin do this? You can sit at home, throw up a little draft and say, this is what it should do. It gets assigned a number. And BIP39 was a proposal to generate private keys from a passphrase. Uh, so instead of generating a private key randomly, which is what everyone should be doing, you generate a passphrase randomly, and then you get an algorithm to say, give me passphrase number one. And then number one is a unique uh, private key. Then give me oh, give me key number two, and then it gives you a unique, uh, deterministically created key. Uh, and this is the opposite of what used to be the case because now you would have your Bitcoin wallet with all these different keys that control different transactions. And now with the mnemonic seeds, you can then have your seed, which was a passphrase, sort of like a password. For, you can generate it from a word list and then you can get all these keys, key zero, key one, key two, key n. Mm, that got implemented and then people are like, okay, what about BIP32, which basically is the same system, but we can derive, you can use the derived key to derive other keys. So now we end up with a tree of keys. Uh, so you go from your seed to your master key and your master key can generate other keys, yada, 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 uh, until infinity and beyond. And uh, this is actually in the Mastering Bitcoin book, chapter five. If you actually want to see more of that, it's on GitHub because the yeah, information does want to be free, but the book is also being sold on Amazon in case you want to fork out some cash. <laughs> so yeah, and cool. And where 
M I. Oh, oh yeah, that's the book. And signatures. Yeah, so signatures are the other thing that I uh, want to talk about. And signatures, basically, you give me a message and I have a private key. I sign that message with my private key and I give you my public key or you probably already have my public key because it's in public somewhere. And you can use my public key to verify that you, the message you gave me was signed using my private key and only my private key. It will probably fail or, or it should fail if uh, otherwise. Uh, so now um, Bitcoin is actually, uh, in my books, uh, one of the most authenticated databases in the world because every transaction belongs to someone specific and only that specific person can spend a coin. Uh, and that's how you know who, uh, uh, it's one of the biggest arguments people want to use to verify who Satoshi is, they would, he would have to sign a message using one of the earlier private keys. And that's how people would know that's the guy who actually invented Bitcoin. But then now, um, if we are using uh, hierarchically deterministic keys to authenticate things, what would be done? Uh, so yeah, I think there's two options here. Uh, I can either talk or I can show the demo uh, for, for this part. So who, which, which one would you like to get first? The demo. Okay, cool. So I uh, kind of put together a proof of concept uh, off.sigidly.com. If you have uh, data uh, or your phone is fully charged, depending on uh, which uh, uh, impact you first data being expensive or load shedding. Uh, you can access the site. Uh, and basically, uh, this is what would need to happen if you are a user now. Um, a user would have to have a wallet that supports some of, some of these functions. So let me do something. Let me delete the database I have here. Oh. So and also show you a few of the operations uh, that your wallet would need to do. Sorry, I didn't clean up. But uh, there's a few operations that you would need to do. One is to create keys, basically to create a new wallet uh, with a random passphrase. And then, yeah, l let me just do that before I skip ahead. So I say create keys. Sure, uh, create keys using a randomly generated seed and that basically generates a mnemonic, a 12 word mnemonic, and that's the phrase. And then a good wallet would uh, give you a random phrase every time. So if I delete uh, my local file again and create another key, these keys are not the same. So, but technically I've lost uh, a wallet by doing that. So now that's my first key in, in the database. Now I want to use my key to, to authenticate myself on websites. So, so the simplest way is to give the website a public key. But then now, since we are using hierarchically deterministic authentication, I'm going to give every website I register on an extended public key so that the website can also derive other public keys from, my, uh, from the key that I provided it. And I'm assured that the website will not be able to derive the private keys because that's how the BIP32 um, spec is, is, is set out. Uh, might, uh, we, might, we might get some time to actually go over some of the details at a later point. But cool. Now I'm like, hey, Mr. Wallet, please give me an extended public key because I want to register on a site. And then the wallet in the background uh, derives a signature, uh, a derivation path to say, um, what's this? Create key number five, and then in key number five, create key number 500, r random numbers. In key number 500, create key number six. And then it generates this XPUB using that. Good question. Sure. The guarantee symbol you have. So yeah. so oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but continue. Yeah, but uh, I can show you. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So the question was, do you guarantee single use? Uh, so uh, to do that in the code the, uh, of the wallet that I kind of hacked together, uh, persistence models. So I store the extended public keys. Okay, cool. 
And so the X pub, I can just say unique. Uh, and uh, the derivation path, I also say unique. And you let the database uh, take care of the uniqueness for me, uh, the database indexing take care of the uniqueness for me. So uh, it will never generate the same X pub twice. Or if it does, it won't return it back to the user. Uh, so now I can go back and call the same function. And then, yeah, these two X pubs are different, as you can see at the end. Maybe at the beginning there's some similarities in some of the keys, but uh, going forward it won't be. So now the user can take their X pub and go to a service and say, okay, these guys probably support extended public keys because it's somewhere in the name of the site. And um, I'm going to call myself B site. That's my display name, and it's like, oh, your display name isn't linked to an account. Yes, I do want to join. And B sides, cool. Now, it's optional for you to provide an email for this uh, specific proof of concept, but you have to give an extended public key. But let's say a user says, extended public key, what is this? Maybe I want to create an um, account with a password. I believe if you are a service and you want to give your users multiple authentication mechanisms, cook that into your registration flow, and then they like with passwords, but we don't do that here. So <laughs> they have to go back and give their XPUB, register with extended public key. And then now they get that. And this is the message they, that they are going to have to sign. Uh, the idea is that, OK, but I'll come back to, to this later. But basically what this is, is this. So this is the me message that a user has to sign. Mm, maybe I can pre this with some JSON. Uh, and yeah, and with the private key at this path. So starting from C. Uh, this is a random number, this is a random number, this is a random number, belonging to the XPUB, so on and so forth. No. So um, now, when after user signs this, they will provide the signature here. So I uh, copy the challenge to clipboard, and then I now want to sign my JS, and then I give it the challenge with all that information and some information that belongs to the server itself. Uh, basically, this is request here and the server signs the challenge that it's presenting the user so that the user knows that, oh, this service actually uh, generated this thing. And uh, if we come back to this more readable one here, the service actually gives the user its own extended public key too, so that for future purposes, the user can also derive some public keys and do the verification. And then the user then signs that. And so they can provide their signature. And then, um, oh, hello, b uh, you are here now. And so now the user can come back and say, oh, now am I registered b sides And then they get shown the message again. And now they will just have to sign this message. And this is the authentication uh, challenge. And so let's say a user doesn't want to copy and paste responses all the time. Uh, you could just leave a variable to say post this to the response endpoint, uh, which is this one, that this service is handling uh, responses to. And once it's done, challenge response accepted. And then the service should have an option to say signed on separate device and the user gets signed on. Oh. So that's basically how the demo works. But uh, just the rundown uh, for the talk or the steps that went behind it. So a service, uh, if you are the CEO, CTO, whoever has the most authority, will have to then create a wallet using a randomly generated mnemonic seed, uh, just like I did with my wallet, and then generate a hardened XPUB. Now, hardened is the word to use when you don't want people to derive your private keys from the public keys that you're sharing with the world. And that's also in more of the technical in-depth chapter five reading. And then the service can generate 
server XPubs. So since the service has a uh, hardened service XPub, they can then say, I have server number one whose uh, private keys are, generate, are derived from my service extended public key, and then I have server number two. So now these two servers can sign messages on behalf of the service, and a user could use the service's extended public key to verify that uh, these messages were actually produced by servers that are in the control of the service. Cool. Cool. And now all the server, all the service has to do is keep its mnemonic seed secure. Because once that gets leaked, everyone can uh, position itself as that service. Now, on the side of the server, it gets a hardened ex uh, extended private key from the service. And then it uses that to sign all messages it produces on behalf of the service. Same thing I just said. And then it keeps the extended private key secure. Uh, now, on the side of the user, the user kind of performs the same actions as the service blah, 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 but it keeps its wallet secure because its wallet then keeps track of its identity on all these different websites. Now, okay, the way is basically the demo. Uh, an HD off wallet basically lets the user create um, a wallet uh, with a phrase and then create random XPubs which have a, which keep track of which service they uh, registered to, and then it signs all these messages on behalf of the user. Now, why would anyone want to do this? Uh, I have a few reasons, actually. I think in total there's like eight reasons. So we're going to go through them. Reason number one, uh, service access keys, but decentralized. Uh, who here has used AWS Signature v4? OK, cool. OK, cool. So. They give you a secret key that's generated by the service, right? Now with this, you are the one who generates your own secret key and then you give the AWS service your public key. So then you are assured that there's no point where the, your secret key is leaked into their logging system because apparently I think Twitter and GitHub uh, leak passwords by putting them in, 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 in the logs. So. Th this is what the, the, uh, the decentralized option of hierarchically deterministic key solves. You are short of the safety, if, un unless you are really bad at keeping your own stuff uh, secure. Mm. Oh. And then another reason is crypto stands for cryptography, because cryptocurrencies are in your face. Yeah, so uh, I believe like cryptocurrencies have done so much for cryptography in the past 10 years. Like, wow, I wouldn't know half the things I know uh, about this presentation if it was not for Bitcoin. But I also think that there's a lot of education that could be done to help people actually understand the cryptography side about it. And we shouldn't hide the details. Like, let a person see an XPub, let a person see an ugly public key. And, you know, the, the more they see it, the more they get used to the fact that, oh, this is actually what's securing my wallet. And reason number three, mutual authentication. Yeah, so, like, uh, I access a service, I access Twitter today. I'm not even sure if that's the Twitter server that I'm seeing or someone hacked it or whatever. But if uh, they just keep one um, mnemonic seed safe and then if a server gets hacked, they can just switch off that server and w work from the uncompromised servers. And I would be able to authenticate the server that I'm accessing to say, oh, this is actually the Twitter server and not some other hacked server that's giving me messages because they would have to hack the mnemonic seed. And then reason number four, who watched the Adam Sandler Netflix special? Okay, uh, yeah, the stand-up one. So you probably know the video I'm about to play. Sorry, we don't have sound, so. Ah. Can you hear it in the back? Okay.
cool. That's all you need to see. So, yeah, basically, all you need is your phone, wallet, and your keys. And uh, cryptocurrencies, you have your wallet on your phone. You might as well have your keys on your phone uh, if we actually use the keys to authenticate you to services and other things like that. And yeah, uh, I think there's been a lot of beef on uh, crypto Twitter about uh, wallets actually doing authentication purposes. But if your password manager did this, then you might as well use it as well, use it as a wallet. So have you been pawned? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the worst thing about being pawned? I think the change in the kickoff to Cool. Yeah. So. Anyone who follows Have I Been Pawned or Troy Hunt would know the main beefs. What? Oh. <laughs> I was like, I definitely have it. In, yeah. So uh, these are all the leaks that have come out on Have I Been Pawned in the fa past few months. December 4, November 22, November 19, November 19, November 18, November 10. October 31, blah, 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 it goes on and on. But basically, uh, there's a leak every now and then. Sometimes you've registered with a site uh, when you were 16, and then it only gets hacked now, and then your pa the password you used to use then, it's in plain text, and you only find out later that blah, 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 blah. And uh, the main beef I, uh, most people have is because trusted third parties are security holes. Uh, any website is a good target for anyone who wants this information. Uh, uh, that's why I basically also made registering with your email an optional thing. Uh, you can just register, have an account, you do what you ever, whatever you want to do on the service, but in, if you're only going to keep your email there if you trust that I didn't write bad code. And I did, because this is a proof of concept. If you see the things, you'll cry. Now, cool. Uh, reason number six. Yeah, um, quite sure someone in here knows what this is. Yeah. Oh. So, what is this random bullshit at the front of the onion? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I meant to point into that. Yeah. Oh. So, this is. I I was shocked when I learned what this is actually. Is uh, it's a part of the public key that belongs to this Tor service. So now I'm like, why is it then we do not take uh, this is a version three of the onion addresses and we use the extended public keys so that a service can then propagate its own identity uh, and a user who accesses this service can then say, oh, I'm accessing the actual service because that's the actual URL, but it's a little longer than usual. Uh, but obviously, um, I'm, I don't have the time to set up a hidden tour service just for a demo, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but the idea is that now every Tor website that wants to do hierarchically deterministic authentication just shares its xpub.onion and then you go access that and you then get the extended public key that you can use to verify that the site you are seeing actually belongs to the service that you have interacted with before or the service that you have actually registered your account with. Uh, uh, and of course, if you register with the hack service, uh, you can authenticate that you have actually accessing their hacked service. Uh, so number seven, OAuth and federation. Uh, so now I was thinking, uh, let's say someone does a hierarchically deterministic website. Now they implement an OAuth, OAuth server. All the requests that a user, uh, now if I go to Twitter and Twitter has a login with HD auth, and they can sign that they are using this derived key on Twitter. And then whenever they have to provide their password for Twitter-related actions, the HD off service derives another key on the... Oh, that, that guy gets in. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So can you explain it? <laughs> yeah, so if you, uh, I think what you're saying is mm -hmm. if you... 
mm -hmm. um, with an HD auth front end, mm -hmm. right? That the password that OAuth sends back, mm -hmm. or the token that OAuth would send back, mm -hmm. would be not only uniquely created each time, mm -hmm. um, but it would be separate and apart from your XPub. So, and because it's separate and apart from your XPub, extended XPub, mm -hmm. um, there's no traceability back to the originating user yeah, well. because the token that's created is divorced from the XPub that's entered. Cool, Leo. Mm. Thank you very much. Huh? Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, mm. Does that mean that, okay, I get that it's a single use mm -hmm. uh, round trip, mm -hmm. yeah. but does that also anonymize you? Uh, yeah, in a, in a similar way that the sign in with Apple would anonymize you. But if you then choose to share your actual email with that service, whatever benefit you're getting from uh, um, the whole, hmm, it, just, <laughs> it just goes away. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Anyone who wants to implement that, have fun with it. So deep fakes and Photoshop social media pages. Let, social media. Let me. Cool. I'm going to post this as a tweet, Fred. Cool. Uh, they say deep fakes are an issue. Or they are going to be an issue, whatever uh, they say. But if you can sign everything that you are posting so to social media, and it can be verified, by just using your extended public key. It won't be a problem. Uh, so you register with Twitter, put, give it an XPub, and then every post gets a signature from you. And no deep fakes, no Photoshop, social media pages, but people are always going to... Well, on a technical level, because the bigger problem is people's the emotions. Is somebody else posting something that is claimed to be yeah, mm, so but they can sign it and verify that they posted it, but it's not actually you sitting there saying whatever they claim that you're saying, mm -hmm. but they can pretend like it's a recording, but it's actually a deep fake of you. Yeah, but for them to sign it, they would have to have your private keys. And the private keys only you say... Social media posts. Yeah. Of like something that they've recorded of you. Mm -hmm. With your, they have to have your private key. Otherwise, the signature won't verify to belong to your uh, extended public key. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm saying they're posting it as themselves. Uh -huh. They're saying, yo, I just oh, oh. saw this guy. And then they just give a random signature. He's a Nazi and I'm posting that onto, like, mm -hmm. But if someone who wants to verify it has the option to say, yo, what's the signature for this thing? Oh. Well, you sign mm -hmm. the six that when someone else posts it, we know it's you. Yeah. It's you verified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But there's also kind of strong legal implications because one is that you. Well, one can add, verify that you didn't post a second, you can verify that somebody else posted it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know exactly that you have to go after that guy that's been posting nonsense about you. Mm -hmm. so, and you can't lie about it. Yep. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think a few things would be required for this. Every social media service will then have to integrate with any wallet that supports the BIP32 specification so that as a user, you don't have to actually type in your private key all the time. You just say yes or no. Uh, Mm -hmm. What would drive adoption of this versus everything else? I mean, that's the number one reason why things like PGP fail, just because mm -hmm. user adoption is so low. Oh, I think it might. Uh, let me just start with this and see that. Uh, uh, but um, I think uh, since Bitcoin, a lot of people have money on it. Uh, uh, that would be a drive. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> PGP if you want to be secure, but not too many people want to be secure. But a, a lot of people want to keep their money secure. So, yeah, uh, and it leads to kind of this. Uh, when do you find out that a site has been storing passwords insecurely? Have I been pawned? Uh, uh, comes in. Oh. Yeah, and. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. When you're hacked, you also find out. And the other thing is, what's this? Uh, the hashing algorithms that are used on most of uh, the sites are really, you know, lame. Uh, even Bcrypt, as good as it is, I've said it to, what, three, uh, three rounds? And I'm like, oh, I'm really risky for, pro uh, for doing this on a production system. But, you know, uh, somebody is still using MD5, so I'm okay. <laughs> 
So, yeah, and I think the cool thing with this is since it's also used on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, people would know when the cryptography is played out because a lot of money would start moving to some other actors. Uh, you will see your own wallet sitting at a balance of zero and you would know that the cryptography is broken or you have leaked uh, your own private key. Uh, cool. And when will you know when a uh, crypto graphic operation becomes insecure relates to the whole um, quantum computing is a thing is it not a thing is it a thing are people losing their money business and yeah but really how so yeah uh, if anyone wants to check it out they can either go to the site or code.sigidli.com.hd off let me blow that up a bit Mm, yeah, and that's where most of the code is. And let's see if I can access it real quick. Ah. Oh, I removed an H. Cool. And you will find my example wallet. Uh, everything is written in JavaScript. Uh, the site, uh, that is the proof of concept. And I uh, think I'm also trying to make a passport a HD off. Uh, implementation. Uh, Passport JS, uh, if anyone has used it, their strategies and anything. <sighs> Wasted so much time working on this and no one in the house <laughs> actually uses it. Uh, so, yeah, but the main two things the um, off.sigidl.com website, which is what you are seeing here. And yeah, you can test it out. Uh, you can donate some coins to that address if you have some to give away. And yeah, maybe one day the Onion V4 will actually be alive and uh, I'll work on that. But yeah, the other thing I learned while working on this is that... Oh, okay. <laughs> is that what it sounded like when I was playing my video? Damn. <laughs> Facebook actually has an Onion URL. Like, uh, yeah, the real Facebook. This is Facebook. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Uh, I, I, not yet. I can't be sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, so if anyone wants to use, oh, they even have an SDN, wow, this is so too much. Uh, but if anyone wants to share their private information securely, uh, I recommend you use Facebook via Tor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's about it from me. Uh, any questions, any remarks? Okay. Yeah. So the question for the camera is, uh, how do you keep your wallet secure? Uh, I think the main thing is in the Bitcoin space, they have this idea of a, um, what's this? A hot wallet and a cold wallet. So the cold wallet, you don't even connect it online and all these things because you, you, you will get hacked. And the hot wallet is connected to the internet and it's, and it's the one that you walk around with all the time. So I think cooking up from that is you do the same thing that the XPUB that your wallet produces is also then has a feature whereby you could generate a cold, a hot wallet type thing and you only use the terminal thing for generating hot wallets and whenever that hot wallet gets hacked, you revoke that key. But then it's the same thing with key management. How do you do key rotation? How do you do key revocation? And yeah, that's a very hard thing to get right. Hmm. Wouldn't it be that in that case that you would have actually more than one wallet though, if you were having a hot wallet and a cold wallet? 
uh, think you would have maybe maximum two. Uh, the cold wallet is where the main keys are and the hot wallet is where your logins are. Uh, so in the event whereby you, you do get hacked, only those logins are impacted and you use your cold wallet to revoke all of these other ones. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the premise of this was that encryption is broken, but if I compare this to like certificate signing, mm -hmm. root CA has to keep their private key you know, very, very secret, there's, mm -hmm. there's the key pass ceremonies and all of that. Mm -hmm. Aren't we sitting in the same hot water here because you have the mnemonic key that you have to keep secret? So uh, um, at, the, at the base, before you go further down mm -hmm. the technicalities, you still have some sort of secret that someone gets. Yeah, so, so we, okay, so the question is, is this as bad as having a root certificate authority? It's clearly better, but aren't we mm, sitting yeah. in the same okay. sort of root issue? Yeah, so the... Cool thing is, instead of having one security authority holding the route for millions of sites, yeah, uh, 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 so hacking one guy in the crowd is not the same as yeah, yeah, hacking, yeah. you know. Yeah, oh, but but uh, there was a question in the middle. Yeah, uh, so just on the X Club and using them, it sounds really great, it's a good idea, but how do we make it easy for users to move the what The QR code stuff. Uh, oh, so uh, have more integration with the Q oh yeah so the question is how do you make uh, the whole HD off thing uh, easy for the users so they, from the user side they just see a QR code take out their phone and then the phone posts the response to the service and then all the user gets to see is a QR code. Uh, there, there are apps that currently are doing this Zapper, Snapscan and all of these things I don't even know what what is in that QR code? I should actually look at that. <laughs> but um, it, it, for me, I feel like it's a similar workflow. It's just that now we are adding a registration step to it. I'm going to let Google figure it out. <laughs> this one. How old is this? <laughs> Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Cool. Mm. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank that gentleman for bringing up a uh, well-known researcher, uh, Steve Gibson. Uh, he, he is in charge of a podcast called Security Now, which talks about a lot of what he mentioned about how the development of Squirrel. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's for anyone who's keen, Security Now is a good po podcast to listen to when you're free. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think. Was there a question over there? I thought I saw a hand. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I had a few recommendations just to wrap things up. Um, especially as you were talking about the new biometrics and other things, right? Uh, and it's, I think it's called the $5 range problem. Like you have all these things that are making the thing easier uh, to use, but then some guy comes with a wrench and says, "I'm going to beat you, uh, beat the private key out of you." <laughs> so, the easier it gets, the uh, less harmful to a user it actually becomes. Because you, if you are ever at an airport and they like unlock your phone, and your phone is actually what's authenticating all these other services, then they also have access to all these other services. So. 
uh, as much as we should make it easier on the user, we should have guards in place to say, okay, uh, uh, this can happen and that could happen and uh, keep, keep users secure. Huh? So yeah, that's it from me.